Is it clear where you hand over the keys? I mean, and I can just tell you, I guess, but. Okay. Can you, you can all hear me, okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. the very first slide, yeah, the very first slide is just, uh, it's just, you know, whatever, it's just the title of the paper and oh. something, something like that. Yeah. I don't think it's any very. So while you are recording, just go to the slide for just a few seconds. Oh. First slide. What's that? <clears throat> yes. Now you jump because you are recording. Oh, you're worried about the recording. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So some of the topics um, the Mitchell paper is sort of discussing. Um, so, you know, in general, this whole what does uh, meaning mean for, you know, large language models? Um, you know, we're concerned about that as computer scientists. It's also of relevance to philosophers, cognitive scientists, educators, et cetera. Um, so one of the big issues here is sort of, can you say that large language models um, understand language? Um, so, you know, some people would suggest that, you know, the primary roadblock to any, um, you know, deficiency in understanding is associated with the number of parameters in the model. Um, and so, you know, the idea being we just need a bigger model. Um, you know, is are the models we have or future models with larger parameters, do they represent a general model of intelligence or not? Um, and sort of, you know, supporting this uh, view is, you know, favorable measurement results um, from empirical work on um, issues like entailment, um, lexical ambiguity, and forced judgments. Um, and then on the other side, there's sort of a, a skeptical uh, perspective. Um, and so, you know, people in this camp would argue that, you know, language models lack embodiment, um, which sort of deals with your interaction with the real world. Um, they are concerned about the construct validity of the measures and the metrics that we use to assess these kinds of models. Um, they point out that there are spurious features that are correlated with responses. Um, so they talk about this in the paper as shortcut learning. Um, language models lack explicit mental models um, that humans uh, engage. And then um, there's this distinction between formal versus um, functional competence. So we can go to the next slide. Oops. Oh, wow, it went black. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is kind of uh, Mitchell talks about, like alludes to these, but doesn't sort of explicitly define them. Um, so there's sort of two uh, different approaches to, you know, what meaning is. Um, so the first is uh, propositional semantics, and this is sort of the traditional view um, and one that um, is sort of born out of like formal linguistics and philosophy, but the idea is that meaning is contingent on a proposition, so a particular idea that is independently verifiable in the real world. Um, and then the second approach is this idea that semantics is distributional, so meaning is um, represented by a distribution of all of the different contexts in which you might use a particular word. So, uh, you know, uh, for the students, uh, a while ago, I have talked to you about um, uh, real world semantics and uh, uh, the conversations, uh, uh, the discussions that knowledge representation used to have in 1980s, uh, in terms of saying that you have a, um, you know, uh, uh, the computational world, uh, the model world, model world meaning like schema kind of thing, computational world would be the data on which uh, you know you write a program to manipulate, and then uh, so computational uh, representation. I forgot exact what they use. Uh, model world, which is typically conceptual model, like ER model, we used to do, and real world, which is you know how the uh, concept is in the real world, in the in actual world, where model is simply a modeling of that, right? Uh, like ER model is never a comprehensive or complete model of the real world, but it is a model. So this proposal semantics that you know the term used is uh, aligned with the same thing. I mean, uh, different community, uh, you know, this this these three levels of model uh, that I just talked about is the um, uh, way people in um, uh, you know knowledge representation branch of computer science used to discuss. That was also the AI branch of computer science of 1980s. 
uh, the the other people who have used this word propositional semantics, but they generally represent the same thing. But it is certainly this totally distinct from the distributional semantics. And that's uh, you know, Ahmed brings up a really good point. Um, and sort of formal linguists and philosophers would dif differentiate semantics associated. Um, and they'll use the term intentional versus extensional semantics. Um, and so the idea that there is a distinction between semantics associated with um, an individual um, text or dialogue and then sort of extensional parts that are associated with the real world. Um, so if you see those... Sorry to interrupt you. So, so, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm lost here. Okay, so uh, I, I don't know what is the point here. I mean, instead of just, you know, uh, talking it's, about... What is meaning? Yeah. That's so, a no, question. No, I'd like to put my... So propositional semantics come from linguistics, okay? <laughs> and people like, you know, Manning, uh, Arvind Joshi, and Joaquin Nuri. So these are the key three figures of this propositional semantics and who extends well, it. No, 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 no. So, so, so again, that's, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a national language uh, community. That right. is oh, not the same as their community. So everything is, you know, every, and that's not the same as logic community. So people have given different words and different interpretation these three levels of things was distinct in the KR world. Uh, that was, I don't think I, it was three uh, level in agree. the linguistic world. Yeah, but, but uh, you know, this knowledge world is typically... Uh, and, typically and, and sorry, I sorry no. to say that uh, Manning is much, uh, uh, you know, people were way before Manning uh, talked about this kind of stuff. So, you know, I mean, I, I, I have all the respect for Manning, nothing, you know, uh, uh, but, you know, uh, we are talking about, you know, I think Arvind and BF4. Yeah. Right. So let, let me just before let me preface the, the, the rest of the, the discussion. We need to elevate our perspective. Mm -hmm. This is not about what we in this room or even we in computer science think about the nature of meaning. If you're going to make a contribution in this area, you have to understand how the various academic disciplines think about this problem. And that's why this is important. And I i have a little thing, Savannah and I didn't coordinate all that great. Um, I have a little thing on extensional and intentional semantics too. This is an age old, what does it go back to? Um, you, would, you would know better than me in, in computer science. This is like really old stuff. And we have to go back to couching the current situation in terms of the legacy literature. Okay. That's the argument that we're making. I, I got, let me finish my take here. I mean, you don't have to answer now, but uh, I believe this knowledge and this terminology actually typically <clears throat> came out from the database spin out in NLP researcher community. No. Or I, I mean, my take, an IR, IR turnout in NLP researcher community. And propositional semantics always been a key for, you know, computational linguistic people who are very core to NLP people. And there are, you know, a plethora of work on propositional semantics. Even if and uh, you know, I, I mentioned about three people, there are many. So those are the three things. And uh, a combination of professional semantics and distribution semantics also been actively done by all this, you know, prior research. So I don't know what is the point of you know, uh, this slide, but so that's my take. We can again come back. Okay. Well, the, the the point is to situate the dialogue in a broader framework. I think Ahmed, this is Frega. I think this comes from, uh, this goes all the way back to Frega. So can, uh, is, I have the similar confusion as Dr. Das, so mm -hmm. I am just uh, not coming from the same place, but I'm having a hard time understanding the point of this categorization. Mm -hmm. Because it, it makes a distinction be, between the kind of semantics that could possibly be provided in a large language model and the kind of semantics that you as a human being can apply. This is, I understand that's that. very, very important. Reason for this uh, yeah. slide. I okay. don't understand what it's saying. Yeah, say the it's, same it's just making a distinction between the two frameworks for understanding semantics. Yeah, so the, the, the okay. propositional framework and the and the and the distributional. So framework. are they supposed to be at a contrasting? Each? Yes, they are. They are the, the first one really um, is associated with the notion of grounding in the external world. Okay. And the second one is associated with obtaining semantics according to the relationship between terms in your internal to your model, which is why it's called intentional. 
Oh, that makes, I think we should have just worded it like that. Well, we had, we, you know, we have the two sections. Sorry about that. We put this together quickly. But the first one, you know, I would say is sort of an extensional semantics kind of notion where the way to think about this is it extends into the real world and intentional is in internal to the terminology okay. in the representation. Thanks. So there is a figure, in, there is a figure in this paper, uh, you know, on, uh, you know, uh, page, uh, 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 you know, figure one on, you know, something page yeah. five or six. Uh, that was inspired by the work in the knowledge representation at that time. But basically says there is, you know, uh, on the right hand side is concepts, you know, or, or objects in the real world. And on the left hand side is schema and that they are different. There is a boundary to be gained from what we can represent versus what it is. Yeah. Uh, just just yeah. that appreciation is important. Um, uh, and, and distributed semantics is coming only from what you have in terms of, you know, the words. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What is the meaning of this uh, diagram on the right side? Um, separation. So okay. The distribution uh, uh, figure, Savannah. Decoration. <laughs> okay, just referring to di distributions, okay. just distributions. Yes. Okay. Just an yes. example distribution. So we we kind have... of are... go ahead. Sorry, sorry about that. You all turn off your camera. It's very hard to tell when you're trying to talk. Uh, <laughs> just put it in the chat to your camera. Oh, yeah, turned off. Um, but we kind of already talked about this, but sort of the main idea, you know, the main distinction here is that you know propositional semantics has this. Uh, connection to the real world um, that distributional semantics lacks. And so sort of even if, uh, you know, you subscribe to some aspects of the distributional view. Um, so go back to the slide. Yeah, let's yeah. go back, you're way ahead of me. <laughs> okay. So Savannah, I have strong disagreement uh, on the rate, you know, text you have. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, well, ideas. you can take it or leave it. So uh, when you say that distribution, everything is distributional, no, it's not. Basically, I mean, uh, unfortunately, again, my view with due respect. So this comment I always find with people who did not really understand the distributional semantics, don't know the details of the last 30 years, what happened. And there are a lot of things happen. And when you oversimplify saying that everything is not distributional, actually, then you don't know what happened and what is actually happening. So uh, this is true simplification <clears throat> and for criticism. I mean, that's my take. Okay, so um, let's, I, I understand where you're coming from. Let's identify this as the issue. This is the issue that we are debating. Is the current implementation of distributional semantics adequate to cover Okay. semantics okay. and that's there that's there are going to be and this is always the case in science there are going to be people who say something more and nothing but yeah. this happens all the time we are not in a particularly unusual situation maybe, maybe, <laughs> completely. yeah and sort of as Valerie alluded to this is you know intended to be a discussion and yes um we can move to the next slide please all right, um, so some more issues that they bring up in the paper. So, you know, what is the significance of the common mechanism? Um, so for example, we can think about airplanes and birds that both fly, but they don't necessarily use the same mechanism. Uh, there's this sort of issue of like innate versus learned um, behavior. There's um, embodiment issues, social cultural guidance issues. Um, there's uh, sort of the issue of whether or not machines are the sort of kinds of things loosely construed that can understand in general. Um, do models reach conceptual understanding in the absence of physical experience? Um, and then sort of is if there's functional equivalence between these two um, approaches to language and we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so, you know, the general thing is that uh, if you're going to describe the understanding in the context of uh, the world as it exists, uh, you know, and both, I mean, the physical world as a well conceptual world that humans have uh, made up, then uh, the answer would be no uh, for, you know, understanding of machine. But if you describe um, uh, 
you know the uh, uh, you know world as in model uh, in, you know in some form or is it a closed world assumption of such you know then uh, yeah uh, you could say that uh, your computational system uh, has understanding so that is where uh, uh, you know uh, philosophical uh, i think distinction will come as to what do you yeah. consider you know how you ground ground understanding is is yes. Yes. So what is Occam's razor? Right? Occam's razor means the simplest, you should use the simplest model that you can in describing a scientific phenomenon. And so, you know, really, you know, do you need all this innate versus learned embodiment, socio cultural guidance? Or not? I mean, it does make for a much more complicated model. Um, on the other hand, you guys have a lot of parameters. So, you know, this is a, this is a criterion for evaluating the quality of our explanation. Nice yeah. So it comes from psychology. Yeah. is a very old philosophical uh, phrase. And the one line description that you will find is the simplest solution is the best solution, or the simplest solution is probably the right solution. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 That's a Occam phrase. Yeah. We'll have a little more philosophy of science today. <laughs> That's not the only one. <laughs> Alrighty, um, so this is kind of an example of sort of differentiating this issue of, of sort of language fluency versus what constitutes understanding. Um, so you can think about if you're like having a conversation with a friend, um, so you're talking on your cell phone, um, and maybe you're like talking on your cell phone and you know your friend is uh, in Europe and you're in the US. And so you're having this conversation and you know maybe you're just having sort of a social conversation. And um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so your the phone cable under the sea is intercepted by an octopus. <laughs> and instead of your friend receiving your messages, actually the octopus is just sort of tinkering around and has some magic key for responding to you. Um, no, go back. This is a Chinese room argument, okay. Just yes. Hold on. What is the conclusion of these slides? Right. Well, good. why don't you let her finish you that? You let me finish and I'll, yeah. you'll find out. <laughs> so okay. the okay. point here is, you know, if you're having sort of a social conversation with your friend, you're maybe asking the friend how, how they're doing, how their week went, et cetera. And you get some sort of, uh, you know, you get some responses from the octopus that all sound plausible, right? The octopus says, you know, week is going great, et cetera. However, if you ask the octopus to do something in the real world, say you're in an emergency and you need, you know, the, the you need your friend to do something for you, um, the octopus can't do that sort of real world aspect. And so the <laughs> my, idea is my, my two penny, okay, adding here. Uh, this is unfortunate, I mean, my, my view on this, uh, unnecessarily Ooh. metaphorically things are, you know, you know, trying to make complex. So there's a definition of language called formality, okay? So when you talk to informal setting, for example, I, I asked Mega, pass the car. I dropped the subject. So when I dropped the subject, there's a reason because in informal communication. And in language studies, you can define and count what is the formality level. If you go to law text, it's very complex. So formality, now why, why when you drop, because we know the search space is very limited. If I, if I pass this information, that other person can fill those gaps and can understand the whole meaning. This isn't about formality. This is about functionality yeah. and, and understanding. And if you look at the bottom in teeny tiny print there, we should actually make it bigger, Savannah. It says Searle. <laughs> and there will be a couple of citations today that we'll talk about where I have to say greater minds than ours, <laughs> much greater, except maybe Amit's, um, Greater minds than ours have worried about these problems before, and we would be very wise to understand the nature of their argument. This is a version of the Chinese room. I think we talked about the Chinese room. Didn't we do the Chinese room? Okay, this is just a version of the Chinese room problem, except carrying it a little bit forward to the problem of the recipient actually doing something non-linguistic in the world that would evidence their comprehension. I believe that's the point you're trying to make, yes. Savannah? 
And the point so, isn't uh, necessarily whether you agree with the argument. The point is that this is a useful sort of philosophical thought yeah. exercise exactly. that helps you think about exactly. what constitutes meaning. Yeah, so same point. So I just put my perspective. So is Kohler, uh, let's say, Daphne Kohler? Is that I, I don't know the Bender and Kohler type. I think so. Let me double check. Um, But well, we can look it up, yes. Van, if you can't find it. Even, I mean, uh, formality, readability, and comprehension uh, are actually very well studied in NLP community. <laughs> Those are also very well studied in philosophy of mind. Yeah, and so, that's the point that I want yeah, to so, make sure we understand. And it's not just going to be philosophy of mind. It's going to be other disciplines that we're going to bring to bear on helping us elevate the debate to a set of issues. All right. Um, so this is sort of not explicitly in um, the Mitchell paper. They sort of allude to this idea about sort of what do we what do we think about when we think of intelligence? Um, so this is that issue in a little bit more detail. Um, so you can think about two different um, conceptions of intelligence. Um, so the classic test based view is that intelligence is the ability to solve structured problems that have one correct answer. Um, this is sort of well epitomized by much of the uh, literature on intelligence testing. Um, and this view sort of specifically emphasized that intelligence is decontextualized from real world features. Um, and then this is the, um, and so sort of some, you know, examples of uh, real world features are things like time pressure, emotionality, et cetera. And this is sort of the intelligence um, concept that M Mitchell and Krakauer address. And we can go to the next slide. Um, so the second view of intelligence is this idea that it's an, it's an adaptive process. Um, it involves the ability to solve complex problems that may have many correct answers or no correct answers. Um, it involves real world context and ramifications. Uh, problems are often poorly defined and people must identify that the problem even exists in the first place. Um, so you can think about, you know, maybe when you were an undergrad and you tried to decide what you wanted your college major to be. Um, you know, that has a very serious, uh, you know, impact on your life, right? Uh, but there's also probably many correct answers, right? So like maybe, uh, you know, instead of computer science, maybe you wanted to major in applied mathematics or neuroscience or some other area. Um, and there's not necessarily like one unanimous answer to this problem because great minds disagree on the, you know, correct undergraduate college major. <laughs> Um, so moving on to the next slide. Um, so, you know, what kind of, so we can sort of think about, you know, what different types of intelligence do large language models exhibit? Um, what qualities of intelligence do they lack? Where can we improve um, language models to give them additional? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I missed uh, this thing. Can you go back uh, uh, in the model of intelligence that we want uh... Uh, this lot of discussion on what is intelligence. So what? Uh, mm -hmm. I, sorry, I'm lost here. So what? What? Which one you are subjecting this to? Um, so right now we're favoring the adaptive view. <laughs> yeah, right now we're talking about the adaptive view. Okay. And you know, I think this sort of, um, you know, we've seen that you know some of our recent AI systems can perform quite well on sort of these standard tasks that we have thought about as sort of diagnostic of intelligence. And so, um, you know, the idea being here that, um, you know, maybe we have sort of created models that can epitomize one particular type of um, approach, but, you know, the further development and advancement of these types of technologies is to think about, you know, how can we expand these, what different aspects of intelligence do they currently lack and how can- so, with, regards to, that, with regards to recent discussion that, um, uh, Turing test has been long outdated. Uh, is this, mm -hmm. do people use this context to uh, uh, talk about, uh, uh, you know, that uh, why Turing test is outdated? So, uh, Savannah, did you happen to look at the Sternberg paper? paper? This is looking very Sternbergish to me. Yes, this is a Sternberg. Yeah, paper. okay, that's where this came from. Yeah, uh, well, I would say that at least in the psychological community, not yeah. specifically addressing the Turing test, but but in general, 
you know, how do we conceptualize intelligence and intelligent behavior? This is a more contemporary view. And this is interesting because it actually comes from somebody who, can you back up one, Adipa? Who actually developed a career in this stuff, <laughs> developing, you know, intelligence tests with right answers, et cetera. And now he's sort of thinking, oops, you can go forward. Oops, um, there really is an adaptive capability to intelligence that's not well captured by the old fashioned conceptualizations of what it means to be intelligent. And the other thing that I would say, I think this is a really good slide, Savannah. Um, Tallini isn't here, uh, but, but some of you, uh, maybe Deepa had this comment. I'm not sure. One of you had said to me, I can make chat GPT perform better if I ask it better questions. And my response to one of you, was it you? No. no. Okay. And my response to you was, I want an intelligent system that takes my dumb question and provides an intelligent answer. So what you're doing by refining your question to make chat GPT give you a good answer is actually incorporating in all of the intelligent functions. And then chat GPT can, can respond. Yeah. Professor, there are already tools available now where you can just put a random question that you have in your mind and it will create a much better informative prompt for chat GPT. Okay. So again there is some they're 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 working they're working on it and that addresses exactly I think Savannah's press the so yeah what what do we have to do? And that apparently is you know is one of the steps that, that needs to be accomplish so the way we have um, tried to classify intelligence in the classic view and the adaptive view is the ability to solve problems whether it is a problem that has one correct answer or uh, the adaptive view which has many or no correct answers why is that the only kind of measure like the ability to solve problems the only kind of measure of intelligence. Yeah, I, I, that is a really good question. And one of the things, I don't know if it's explicit in the presentation or not, but one of the things I really liked about Mitchell was the notion that there might be different kinds of intelligences. And one of the things that Savannah and I have been discussing is that some of our conversation has been assuming, ours, the collective hour, our conversation has been assuming that it's verbal facility with solving clever puzzles that constitutes intelligence. And, you know, I've got a long history of looking at people doing manual labor and identifying the very substantial intelligence that they have. And just even from a broader perspective, still, this bears very much on the analogy project that we're doing, you know, that we're developing a proposal for, because one of the things that we've worried about is how are students going to articulate their understanding of a scientific problem? And, and what is the dependence of language measures and particular language um, skills in the expression of understanding? And we do need very desperately to enlarge our comprehension, our, our conceptualization of what it means to understand and be smart. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. yeah and one perspective I'd like to add is the following. Um, let's say you ask a chatbot or a machine a question and um, the question, machine um, comes up with a, a, an answer um, that human interprets as a very good answer. Does it mean that machine uh, demonstrates intelligence? Right. It, it doesn't. That's the problem. Right? Right? It, 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 that by itself. Why not? Is, no, that, by, okay. that doesn't mean machine understands anything. That, and that's the you know, octopus the, example. The understanding is in the human interpretation of that answer and human decide to be correct. Uh, you need to do more than that. You need to, uh, you know, uh, the machine would have understood if, uh, for example, uh, when human reads that answer uh, and then human can uh, do a follow-up which uh, requires you to understand that answer. It, uh, there is a context that is built by the answer. 
human uh, pursues that and um, it can also ground that in the real world. For example, uh, the, there is an answer of what to do uh, in terms of repairing a uh, uh, let's say car. Uh, you repair, you do something with the car and um, <laughs> then you tell machine, but this is what happened. And the machine is being able to, uh, uh, you know, in that case, machine um, helping you follow through would require an understanding of what could be happening in the real world in the car. Um, if there is a, uh, you know, if there is no transfer of the additional things you observe of so why car is no longer still not working, then you machine did not understand. The human would have understood. Yes. Explanation. So, so I think there is a there is more to uh, what understanding means versus what processing is. This is a restriction I try to make. Doesn't mean that everybody is going to explain, but at least those who listen to my exactly. talk about uh, natural language processing versus understanding, the DEXA and Asunam keynote uh, with the mental health example is what you know. This is what I try to do there. Mm -hmm. Now I so, because I don't have. Because I have not invested enough time to formalize it better and write it up, I don't think it should rise to the level uh, that it needs to be. That's well, maybe, maybe maybe you ought to work on that. Yeah. <laughs> Janendra wanted to make a point. I just had a question. What is our common ground of intelligence that we say that this is our evaluation matter? Yeah, we don't we don't have one. So maybe we should start I, with that. Yeah. That, yeah, okay, but that's not going to be your problem, right? That's going to be my problem. Yeah. Okay. Well, just to be clear. <laughs> and I don't know, see, just to sort of. So let, me add, let me add one point and please move on. Okay. So, see, uh, we are kind of, you know, playing with words and we are playing well, wonderfully with words and we're putting a lot of metaphors. Okay. So, one is I share one video yesterday in the group. So, which give a very particular example. So, one question being asked to uh, GPT 3 versus GPT 4. So one question is asked, okay, there are 100 murderers in a room. You just uh, step into the room and you killed one. How many uh, murderers left? So uh, GPT-3 answered, you know, 100. And uh, the same question being asked to the GPT-4, and uh, the answer is very, you know, very nicely written by GPT-4, says that if there are 500 murderers, you enter and you kill one. How many murderers left? So still 500 because you killed another one, you were also countering the murderers. <laughs> so now, see, uh, without any explicit training, uh, you know, language model is able to do this fantastically. Okay. And the argument we are, you know, saying that it doesn't understand, it has to be something like human being, and we don't know how human being does. We are somehow lost, you know, we are going back and forth. Well, and we don't know how to evaluate, but we, we still want to criticize language model without any proper grounding, and, you know, why we are criticizing. Well, that what what the effort that we're trying to do here, and I, and I doubt we're going to get through the whole thing, um, is is start to enumerate the criteria. Mm -hmm. What would it mean? And and you know, skipping ahead, I don't know where Savannah is in her thing, but skipping ahead, you know, we're just not the first people on the planet <laughs> or in history to worry about this problem. We ought to look at what they've said about this in the past. And I mean, the point here is not to just be unnecessarily criticizing things. You know, the objective here is, you know whether you you know if if you want to improve language models the idea here is considering things that you know may or may not um, need improved about our existing models and you know what features we might like in you know the ideal gpt 50. <laughs> 50 wow i don't know the the we can yeah oh all right okay so oh, i get to i get, to, I get my piece um it's echoing. Is it done? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, I I like the Mitchell paper because I really do feel it elevated the debate, and it and it started to um, make it you know put it in a more scholarly framework. Um, and and I appreciate that because I'm tired of this thing. This is this is an old movie. Um, uh, it's it's the movie is called Annie Gets Done. And there was a very famous uh, song and exchange, anything you can do, I can do better. And, you know, let's, that's just not helpful here. So let us move on. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, one of the points that I wanna make about 
language comprehension and what it means to understand language is that it is perfectly possible for you and I to read exactly the same thing and come out with completely different understandings of that thing. That doesn't mean you're right and I'm wrong or vice versa. It's just a fact. And and for this quote, I was um, talking about this problem with our wonderful collaborators on the Analogy Project yesterday. And Catherine Riker gave me this, this William Blake quote to express that, that point. So we need to be clear that even though we're looking at the same thing, you and I, we could come up with different opinions. And the same thing, of course, applies to anything that a large language model might do, right? It, it doesn't necessarily have you know, the right, the objective, one opinion. Okay, next. But here is a perspective that I want to add, a criterion that I want to add to both large language models and how you guys read and how you guys write. There's kind of a recursive thing going on here. So I looked at this paper and I thought to myself, good paper, but key points from a larger context are missing. And so I'm gonna describe what those key points are for you, but I also wanna use this to illustrate that that is at least one example of understanding. I'm looking at the words. I'm not worried about what the words are internally. I am looking at those words and relating them to a broader context, and I'm looking at what's not there. And that perspective in, requires knowledge. You have to have a view of what is not on the page to guide your analysis of what is on the page. And Amitava, you should be the first person to appreciate this point because in your analysis of deception, you have made the point that you have to look at the text for what is not there. So I think we're on the same page. All right, so let me tell you, as I looked at this text, yeah, next, what, what was missing from the Mitchell paper? It was a good paper. I hope I made that clear. I liked it, but there was still a bunch of stuff that is missing that will help us elevate the nature of our debate. And I've got them in three bins here, the sort of the psychological perspective, the philosophical perspective, which is extraordinarily important here, and then um, a, a, a scholarly approach called critical text analysis that really kind of merges both, both of the preceding ones. Okay, so I thought that Mitchell did a pretty decent job identifying the measurement problem. So she said, you know, there are, there's glue and there's, I don't know, she, she had you know, a, a couple of, of measures that, that she said are being applied to evaluate understanding. There is a bigger picture from psychology on the conceptualization of understanding and and not by coincidence, it comes from my advisor, <laughs> who, who said there are three dimensions of understanding, coherence, correspondence, and connectedness. And so coherence would be very much related to your distributional notions. Correspondence would have to do with the way in which the concepts map onto the real world. And then connectedness has to do with your ability to do exactly what I'm doing right now, which is set this content in a larger framework. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I have actually two comments. You can answer them in, 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 in the flow or you can you know, come back. So can you go back if I please? See, okay. so we are scientists, we always criticize. I mean, that's fine. Now, if we go empirically, because I'm, I'm a little more empirical guy. Okay, so see, let's say this three problem needs to be solved. Now, GPT-4 uh, cracked 90 exams of the world, including SAT, law exam, and min, nine, mm -hmm. nine zero. So can we take that data? And we take this and see, see if GPT-4 is not able to do this here, and then um, prove it. If we can't, then it is only a theory. 
Um, well, I don't know that you you can you can only falsify, right? You can't you can't no, so prove a theory. But what I would say is that your example is exactly illustrated by the stuff on by the little graphic that I put here on the right. The SAT to end the comments that Savannah made about the old fashioned um, intelligence tests. They're very verbally oriented, representationally oriented. I'm not sure, and this is consistent with what Mako was saying. I'm not sure that those tests are a good representation of intelligence or understanding. Okay, so let's let's okay, let's cite another paper there, and let's claim that this set of not. I'm not happy with this set. I need a better set. But see, today GPT-4 is out, which cracked 90 exams of the world. This is not a, not a you know small news. It's a very big news, right? And a system is out there. You know, you can go and test it live at your face, mm -hmm. and it is tracking 90 exams of the world. So what? And no, but, but there's a big news. No, I, I well, I, I don't like any um, standardized tests, and I've I've talked about this many times with Amit, and he gets really oh. mad at me. I don't like any of the clinical screening tests. I think they are all crap. Fine. <laughs> and now, at the other <laughs> hand, we are saying key that it is not able to do it, and this and that. So either we have to prove it. Or why should people listen to us? Because the, we are in the, this is an eternal pursuit to conceptualize understanding and intelligence. Well, as I said earlier, this is not our first rodeo. This is not psychology's first rodeo. And I think I have a slide on that coming up. Um, the, this is the eternal problem. Nothing new here. And it's always the case that what psychology does is up their game on the conceptualization of the test. So, you know, what should the test be? Okay, so it's probably not SATs and GREs. Probably not. That's probably not going to get to the um, correspondence issues that we care about. So we got to change the test. Okay. So, you know, it's a it's a ever increasing stress test, I guess is what you would call it. And the second part is that I believe I also I mean just go back if I one more slide. I believe one more. Yeah, so I believe you, you example that you know same input might end up in different output within different personality. So I believe, I mean, I also talked about that yesterday. See, we don't want AI to develop personality because we de bias AI. Okay, so if, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Hold that thought, hold that thought. I'm not sure we're gonna get to it today, but I do have something to say about that in particular. But the point here is, the, the Blake one was two people see things differently, but the but the Gary Klein uh, citation is one of the things that constitutes intelligence and, and understanding is to look at something and see what is not there. I'm bringing to bear an understanding that is not in the paper and and I suggest is also a requirement for intelligence and understanding. Okay, this is... Um, um, an example from the Chomsky um, New York Times paper. Um, my underlines disappeared for some reason. Um, and, and it's his effort to describe what a better test would be. And he says he, that you need to be able to describe what is not the case, what could be the case, and what could not be the case. Now, now I think we can agree that that is a hallmark of intelligence. And now I want to put this in a historical context. Why did Chomsky say that? Did he just pull this particular example of intelligence and understanding out of the air? This reminds me of, so what both Dr. Das and you are talking about it. Uh, I've been reading um, GPT-4, uh, for example, they dwell on uh, very hard questions from some entrance exam. Uh, but then when uh, that same entrance exam, so GPT-4's cutoff is 2021. Mm -hmm. When you asked easy level exams from that same entrance test, post-2021, it got none of them. <laughs> the simple things, okay, so, that's interesting. Uh, 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 because they are not releasing anything, right? We don't know if there's data contribution yeah. issues. But the point is that that was not a one-off experiment. They mm -hmm. did that with multiple entrance exams. And had that flaw. That even with coding tests. Yes. They say GPT is famed for its coding abilities, but for coding tests, for post its cutoff, it got zero for it. Yeah. 
So the question is that uh, this is reminding me of this. What is not the case is really hard for these kind of models or what could be the case. It is absolutely really hard. But why from a historical perspective? Why did Chomsky put this? This particular thing as the hallmark of intelligence. Chomsky put this. Why? It feels to me like you're trying to indicate Chomsky. Chomsky. Yeah. But but intuitively, I feel like he wants he wants a comprehensive and overall understanding, like not just what is, but also what is not. That that basically takes care of everything. Okay. So that's a that's a that's a description of the consequence. But the reason he put this here is because this defines his contribution to linguistics. In defining generative grammar, he said, this is what is possible and within the scope of language, and this is what is not. And so I point this out as Another example of me reading some text here and having a much broader perspective on what he meant and why he said this. And in addition, his point is, of course, well taken, but this constitutes his contribution. OK. All right. Now, like I said, this is just not our first rodeo. Um, and I, I do think that Mitchell did a nice job elevating the measurement issue and the need for better measures. We have seen this kind of problem everywhere in psychology. One version of it is in comparative psychology, where we look at the difference between animal capabilities and tool usage and language versus human capabilities. And, and the argument looks exactly like the one that we're having right now. <laughs> <laughs> we start out we start out with one test and the chimpanzees or whatever pass that test and so we go up well, no that's not right that's not good enough better have another test and on and on and on until we finally narrow down that precise difference that distinguishes human capability from animals and i'm not sure that we're you know we're on a pathway we're still we're still working on this problem um but this comparison notion infiltrate psychology everywhere. So, you know, to try to understand the nature of human intelligence and understanding, we often take a developmental perspective. So what do little kids do? And you know, how do they acquire their understanding? What is the difference between what they can do at one age versus another? And, and what does that say about the acquisition of knowledge? And then, you know, then there's that decay phase <laughs> where you lose access to your to your memories, et cetera. And then we do expert novice comparisons all the time. The classic example is in um, chess experts. You know, what do they know? What what what? How do we describe their understanding versus um, the understanding of a novice? And so the point that I want to make here is one that I've made six times, but I'm going to make it again. Not our first rodeo. OK, so might be new to you, but it is new to us. OK, next. So I saw a um, paper uh, some time back on uh, on mathematically defining intelligence in the sense that um, we don't talk about these uh, psychological issues that much, but we say that generative AI is a good step because you're generating a sequence. It's harder to um, dupe someone that you have generated the right sequence. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to dupe someone when you just predict yes or no. Mm -hmm. So generative AI has a lower probability of being a cheat code to downstream task success. Mm -hmm. And so uh, now fundamentally the question is um, a language model's capacity to um, uh, for working memory. So as you keep increasing that, it can generate longer and longer sequences, mm -hmm. fold more coherent thoughts or mm -hmm. correspondent thoughts. And I forget the third thing that you mentioned. Uh, connected, connected this, yeah. Uh, connected. Where working memory and search of your knowledge is a huge issue, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so uh, it's uh, at least so far, I am i haven't, maybe I missed it, heard anything uh, to disprove the case uh, that if you just keep making language models bigger, they'll be able to do work. Well, you, you, the one thing that we have suggested is it has to be able to identify what is missing. Uh -huh. 
tell me that. Tell me how you're going to solve that problem. I want you to read Mitchell mm -hmm. with GPT-4 and tell me what is missing. If you can do that, and I, I confess, I'm, I'm behaving a bit like Chomsky here uh, because I can do that. So, uh, Can your it, models do it, that? What is missing? What does it mean? What? Well, I've just given you a whole bunch. Well, I haven't given you a whole bunch, but I've given you some things that the the Mitchell argument is just an example of a common problem that psychology has worried about for decades, at least a hundred years, and we would be wise to be informed on how to solve that problem by looking there. That's missing. This is missing. And there's a bunch of other things that are missing. It's not so in I, the argument. I agree with that. So the thing that confuses me a lot is um, people say that humans do extrapolation, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why they can say what is missing, what is not missing, counterfactual reasoning and all that. Maybe just uh, may, I may be stumbling a bit, but I'll try to finish my thought. Um, but let's say there is a man you pull from 1800, right? And you show them an iPhone. Mm -hmm. They'll say this is a stone, mm -hmm. right? So humans don't extrapolate. They do just interpolate and generalize mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. within their, their, their experience. Yeah. Yes. So uh, say I tell a language model, give me an analogy between a quantum computing and playing soccer. It will do it for me. Mm -hmm. It has done it for me. We tried that example when I was helping out with the Bank of America proposal. But if I tell a language model to say that, uh, what is the similarity between going to a haircut shop and asking for a rainbow colored mohawk versus going to a Japanese restaurant and asking for Colombian beef? A human would say that both of those are absurd requests. Mm -hmm. A language model won't do that. Mm -hmm. It will say that I'm just confused by what you said. Mm -hmm. uh, but does that mean humans are extrapolating? They may have higher uh, ability to abstract. Uh, but Well, I have a personal view on this but I'm not sure I'm right, but I have a personal view. There is something outside of, there is a, a form of knowledge outside of the strictly linguistic content that allows you to resolve these issues. And, you know, I'm gonna point back to, I, mean, I love doing this because, <laughs> because he knows he's set up for this. When he evaluates deception, mm -hmm. he doesn't just look at the text, he uses another model to come in and evaluate that text. There's something outside of what is in the model. Isn't this fun? <laughs> <laughs> so I, th I think that's the I think that's the cue, and, and or that's the the clue here is our ability to cast a really wide net on the sources of content and insight that are not explicit in our focus of attention and bring that to bear on the analysis of whatever it is that we're looking at, which is why I really like Sarasi's work and, and the implications of that work and the problem of how we focus or expand our search of knowledge to bring it to bear on a particular situation. I'm very tempted to say something. Can I say something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good conversation. So, uh, something philosophy. <laughs> like you to listen and then we you know, follow. <laughs> okay. So, when atom bomb was, you know, being built. Yes. Okay. So, this our Nails board, who find out. So, they didn't know that, you know, they are building atom bomb because there are, you know, seven, six places that work on different things. His board was a man who find out, you know, they are making atom bomb. And so he tried to make the U.S. president several times, but not. Harry Truman was the, you know, war you know, chief that time. They can, then he became president, but he could not. He finally able to meet Churchill. Okay? And he, you know, kind of explained him for half an hour, what is the situation? What devastating the situation can be? And Churchill listened to him. Okay? And, 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 and understand, Niels Bohr Nobel, got Nobel 20 years back, yeah. his five of his students already know with worried. He's a, he's a big guy, yeah. shot. Okay, and he's talking about this. And he listened to him and you know, look at his you know scientific advice and say, what does this man is talking about? Physics or politics? So see, Professor Bohr, you are saying that this new bomb going to be bigger than the older bomb, but the principle of war remains same. 
So what you are trying to advise me? Forget about it. And uh, we know the history. No? After that, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, my skepticism is we are basically playing the Churchill role here today. Okay, so we are saying, you see, this, you know, language model is just bigger than the older language model, but it does not understand the human, you know, understanding and etc. And we are skeptical. And Chomsky's views are also, I, I you know, believe Chomsky is in the Churchill's in a shoe now. So that's my take. I, I rest on this. Oh, I, I, I don't think that's necessarily the conclusion of what Savannah and I are trying to communicate here. We're trying to help us elevate the criteria for evaluating these things. Oh, all right. And 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 it doesn't really matter what position you or I or Amit or anybody takes. What is really important <laughs> is that we articulate the criteria in a better manner than that, you know, Annie, get your gun. I, anything you can do, I can do better thing, which is just not, it's just not going to help us. And uh, as far as the social and political consequences of this, I think actually they are enormous, uh, but also above my pay grade. So <laughs> let me, um, how much time do we have here? Um, so we're not going to finish, but um, so another way to think about the issues raised by large language models comes from psycholinguistics. And, and in psycholinguistics, we make a distinction between, see at the bottom there, the surface form, the articulation, okay? Um, some kind of a propositional interpretation of that. And then finally, at the top, a situation model. So we do not, in psycholinguistics, consider language comprehension as an operation on either the surface form or the text form, but rather on the situation model. And I don't see where your situation model is in large language models. And It might just be that it's a different form of intelligence, but that is a big difference. Um, and there are a number of issues in psycholinguistics that that are don't seem to be addressed very well by what by large language models. One of them would be the emergence of reference. So, so um, how do I gather up? facts about Renjith and it's this Renjith and not some other Renjith and get all that kind of coordinated together. Not an easy problem. Um, a final point that a psycholinguist would make that is very consistent with this representation is that with this diagram is that language itself is just a representation. It is not reality. It is a representation of reality. What I'm saying right now, I don't know that you know there's a speech signal, but it is a, itself a representation and it's designed to emphasize some things, even in my prosody, in the, the emphasis in my voice, it's designed to emphasize some things and get rid of other things. It is not the same thing as reality. And almost all, I, I can't even imagine any psycholinguist who, who wouldn't appreciate this, this concern. Um, and that leads us next, I think we can do the next one at least. Yeah, um, we've already been over this one, so I'm not going to, this is an overlap. This is the uh, sort of, we're now we're transitioning to the philosophy of mind perspective um, and the distinction between intentional, what um, Savannah called distributional semantics, and um, extensional, what Savannah called propositional semantics. And this is a well, well-worn distinction. Um, also from the philosophy of mind perspective, this concern for how our interactions with the world and our physicality leads to mind and understanding has been considered for centuries. So, you know, no matter what we say about lang language models exhibiting intelligence, I doubt, I doubt very strongly that we're going to overcome 
the objections and the insights of the philosophers of mind who have worried about this stuff forever. And for evaluating this debate between whether or not GPT-4, 3, whatever, um, has understanding or intelligence, I think the people for the job are the philosophers and the philosophers of mind. And I would be prepared to see responses from them coming up, un unless they are going to say something like, um, this is so uselessly naive, I'm not even going to address it. Um, so, okay, next slide. Okay, um, but one of the really important distinctions from the philosophy of mind is exactly this point that I made before, the distinction between representation and reality. And if you wanna get somebody's insight on this, who really knows what they're talking about, I refer you to Hillary Putnam. That's the place to look for why there might be a distinction between a language representation and any reasoning that we do on that representation versus reasoning in a real world situation. So there is an example of that that you uh, brought up, I don't know when, that I really like. Uh, I don't know if this is an example, but I'll bring it up. So you said early that uh, a child, uh, they display much higher uh, cognitive function than language models sometimes. <laughs> but uh, they also say things like, I get it this ball. Yeah. So the language model will never produce that. Yeah. Uh, but they cannot do half as much advanced functionality as a child can. Like kick something out of the bottom of a couch with a hockey stick. It couldn't do that, right? But it produces pristine language. Yeah. So um, that may be the distinction between representation and reality, just because meaning is not conceived at the level of words, but associated I, with things or- Yeah, like so there's a, there's a notion of tense or something like that, that the, that the child appreciates. That's not in the, in the speech yeah. stream and they're trying to impose that on, the, on their representation. That's a really interesting, insight and it but it also addresses a point that Mitchell made in the article which is to what extent does the journey of language acquisition in humans need to be there in your large language modeling activities i don't know the answer to that but that is the question to what extent is that trajectory of development an important part of understanding language. Chomsky would say it's absolutely essential. And, uh, but for the large language model people, not so much. So interestingly, when I talked to a very lay person, a friend of mine who's a construction worker, he was just using GPT to uh, come up with new business ideas. He said that uh, somehow we got into some deep philosophical discussion. I don't know why. <laughs> Uh, he said that I'm okay if I learned that the way to push someone and they falling down was to push them a thousand times and they fell down. I'm okay if my concept of causation was learned through just observational correlations. So why are you guys having all this discussion? Just correlational patterns is enough. Uh, it's okay for me. So why should it be such a problem for computer scientists and mathematicians? So I was just stumped by that a little bit. I think what I, I think um, that's a bit of folk psychology. So that's his interpretation of how he learned. Okay. And I think that most developmental psychologists would say that there are um, pre-existing propensities to learn things well, to help you sort through the examples that you're experiencing in the world and tilt you towards learning some things and not others. And just that to it, chime, oh, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I was just, just to chime in on this. Um, so, you know, for example, we know that sort of large language models do not sort of mimic the process by which children learn language, um, notably that, you know, they have just so much more data than people have available to them. and you know, so this idea being that, you know, clearly there is something associated with the mind of a child that facilitates language learning that is not just exposure to language. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think um, 
you know, there's been some good, um, there's like an, a baby LM challenge now, um, with the idea is to, you know, train language models on sort of what babies would, um, sort of realistic stimuli that babies might encounter. Um, but, you know, the idea here is that, you know, language learning and other cognitive processes can't be just correlations because mm -hmm. in order to build a computational model that does that thing, does that particular thing, we need so much more data. See, uh, I think uh, the uh, example of simple search is really interesting to keep in mind that um, you ask for um, a, a question, a search you know, a question to uh, uh, Google and um, the answer came and one of them is very good. Um, uh, now, uh, does it mean that um, uh, the, uh, the search engine has any understanding of what you're looking for, uh, even though it gives you an answer that you found to be useful? No, it does not. It um, uh, gave you uh, gave you multiple results. Uh, it does not really know why one result is better than others, other than the criteria that it uses. For example, I'm not talking about the modern search engine, but the old search engine would use to say, uh, you know, how many um, times that particular search terms are in that document. There used to be that simple thing. Now they become more successful. I mean, more complicated, but. The uh, point is that the search engine doesn't understand anything about what you ask for. Uh, it came, it, it 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 gave you an answer that happens to be good, and your brain uh, has a lot more understanding of what you exactly are looking for and why uh, that particular answer was better than some other answer. Uh, the search engine doesn't have to understand for it to make you happy with the answer you have uh, for what you look for for the document you're looking for. It does not understand the document. It gives you the document that you can read and understand. So I think wow, that, what a... Yeah, so I think okay, let's keep that analogy in mind. Uh, you don't need understanding to uh, give you a, a good answer uh, to the question that you ask of uh, the language model or anything. Uh, but... Gosh, Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so, but, but uh, you know, um, uh, there are, um, uh, you know, so, so on, is, is the uh, asking for a question and getting an answer, or, you know, from which uh, human um, make sure that you got what you're looking for, uh, doesn't rise to the level of, you know, saying whether that machine understood or not. So it's just, you need to keep that in mind. The machine and can be make, very useful. Without you make such a, a great, point here that cues something in me. There's a bit of um, Savannah intentional stance imposition on this. Um, so if GPT-4 gives you a good answer, you impose on it the assumption <laughs> that it understands and it knows what it's doing because it met your expectations. But that is actually an assumption on your part and, yeah. and, and a very um, questionable assumption, actually. Yeah. I, I never thought about it that way, Amit. What a, what a great point. So we have to stop. Um, but um, I'm going to end with, I don't know if we're going to continue this or not, but I'm going to say something that's going to make you guys throw tomatoes at me. Um, and you don't even have the time to respond because you have to go to class, which is great timing on my part. The reason you guys are having trouble with writing is because you are thinking about text the way that ChatGPT thinks about text. Your notion of what constitutes a quality exposition has been biased by this whole argument. And if we have time next time, we'll talk about how the historical context is influencing the way that you are evaluating chat GPT there. Okay, now I'm going to go run away. <laughs> okay, so I believe uh, the, the famous uh, quote, necessity is the mother of all invention, and we can't deny that. So uh, orders like GPT-4s and exception are doing wonderful job in fulfilling the necessity. 
now and this is not going to stop people got you know their interest and it will flourish already gpt5 announced okay so either we have to as a group for our existence we have to prove whatever we are saying or we have to learn because i feel a lot of students don't even understand the depth of you know uh, language model today's technology and etc i'm not talking about everybody i'm just talking about majority mm -hmm. so either we have to learn because uh, nobody is going to you know leave us if we don't learn those things what is being done today or we have to prove our theory and that language model actually doesn't understand mm -hmm. and make our you know presence very clear on the scientific yeah. community i i completely agree with you i vigorously agree with you um, one of the objections that I have with some of my other colleagues on other uh, projects, problems, activities, is that they attack a, a standing method of doing something without making it clear that they understand that standing method. You are spot on. You cannot criticize large language models without understanding in detail what they do. I, I think you're absolutely right. As I scientists, think, that's I think, yeah. So... It, Yes, that is that is uh, uh, absolutely. It is up to us. Uh, it, it is required of us to understand what they can do very well. It is required of us to use them uh, for what they can do well, and it is also required of uh, for us to understand uh, where are uh, you know the opportunities to go beyond what we can do and show that the uh, you know grounding it into the world. Uh, is certainly one of the uh, aspects that uh, we can work on. This is where, uh, you know, are the issues that, um, uh, you know, when we talk about the sensory context and so on and so forth, uh, the, um, you know, rep explicit representation of the world as it is now and grounding it that uh, is going to be an important thing later on. Understanding the context, uh, what user is in mind, that's going to be another very interesting thing and so on. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah, we cannot just criticize it. Uh, it is useful uh, given. That's why I, um, uh, you know, found that particular, um, uh, you know, that podcast that I have shared with you so important, interesting. People are doing really, very really useful things with these systems, and we need to know that, appreciate that, and and then go beyond. Mm -hmm. Time for your next class. Bye. Have a good weekend, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.